Hello, Dr. Wang. Hi, David. How are you? Um, first of all, thank I'm you so great. much for uh, you know agreeing to participate in the Beating Mental Number Project. And uh, really, really excited. Uh, looking forward to chat with you for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Me too, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, even before we get started, let me just uh, acknowledge all the work that you've done over the years in uh, uh, educating patients and uh, making them comfortable. And uh, your uh, uh, resources are used by uh, uh, many of us in dermatology. You've been an asset to the dermatology community for as long as you've been around. Well, thank you very much, David. So I'm gonna introduce you to the audience. And so Dr. David Swanson is a professor of dermatology and he's also the resident program director at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, you know, you completed your medical training in Minnesota and um, you've um, served as an executive um, board member for the International Demoscopy Society, you have over more than 60 publications and the lectures internationally. Um, and we sort of interacted uh, every year at the conference that you run on the Melanoma Demoscopy Conference every December. I think we'll be doing this for almost more than 10 years. It's always been a joy. Um, so I'm going to start right off the bat. And uh, so this is, again, for audience, for public, for patients with melanoma. And, you know, they had a melanoma and they're coming in for skin exams. Most of the time, they're just really, really anxious when they walk in. How do you, what do you say to them? How do you help them to sort of relieve and, and reduce the anxiety level? Well, I think, first of all, I congratulate them for being a melanoma survivor. Uh, and of course, uh, how what what that means has a lot to do with what they had initially for their melanoma. And of course, most of the time these days, melanomas are caught at a reasonable stage and easily cured. Uh, most of the anxiety, as you know, uh, Dr. Wayne, comes uh, from the fear of the second melanoma, in addition to the fear of that original melanoma recurring. Exactly. So the first thing I I, I tell them is uh, uh, when I've been congratu congratulating them on surviving is uh, telling them, but no surprise because you know you've you uh, had good treatment, you had good people taking care of you, and you should uh, do great. And uh, I think it's important for uh, them to follow up with their dermatologist and see their dermatologist on a regular basis, at least for a few years. Uh, from the time of the melanoma. It's controversial how often people should be seen. We usually see people every six months for the first five years, and then maybe we, we'll see them annually uh, after that. Uh, but um, but I also point out to them, look, you know, you've had this melanoma and uh, this life remains worth living and you should enjoy it. And so put things in perspective, life is short and you got to really take advantage of it. So from there, we often will talk about what expectations should be in terms of melanoma uh, re reduction of risk, risk mitigation. And um, so we talk about relative risks. You know, the relative risk, as you know, Dr. Wagner, of getting a breast cancer for a woman is one out of seven. It's quite shocking when you think about it, but then you think about it a little bit further and, and yeah, that's absolutely right. And, uh, and so uh, the relative risk of a melanoma for a um, for a Caucasian living in North America who has not had a prior melanoma is probably one out of forty lifetime risk. Although uh, that is uh, that we we don't know how real that number is. I don't know if you're going to get into the controversies uh, about overdiagnosis of melanoma and melanoma in situ and what we will get to it. Yeah, but. But uh, 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 there are lots of risks, and you mitigate them. So in the case of breast cancer, you uh, follow the uh, uh, American Cancer uh, 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 Association and uh, other uh, organizations, the American College of Physician recommendations, the American College of Family Practice recommendations on screening and uh, following. And in the, and, uh, and in the case of... Uh, uh, melanoma, you uh, the recommendations are controversial, but as I said, uh, we have my um, um, So, I mean, we'll get to the controversy a little bit later, especially over diagnosis, everything. So uh, let me maybe uh, get a sense 
when patients walk in into your clinic, come to see you, how do you examine them? And, uh, you know, how do you sort of pick up the melanoma at the earliest stage without doing a whole bunch of unnecessary biopsy and sort of turning your patient into a Swiss cheese? Because that's another well, fear the patient have, right? Absolutely. And uh, if I can make one more comment, uh, sure. Dr. William, about risk mitigation, uh, you know, you drive up, the, probably the most dangerous thing you do is not go out in the sun. Probably the first most dangerous thing you do is get behind the wheel of a car. And how do you mitigate the risk uh, from that? Well, you follow the ro- rules of the road. You don't drink and drive. You uh, uh, look at you uh, drive defensively, but you aren't going to stop driving. And uh, um, and the same is with uh, uh, outdoors activities. Uh, uh, this is Arizona. People are going to be outside recreating. So you do risk mitigation, just like you do when you drive. Put on a hat, put on the sunscreen, and use the recommendations that we perhaps are going to get into in a little bit. But risk mitigation is, I think, very important. And I think it's important to stress that in a melanoma patient. Yeah, now, I completely agree I do, with you. I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think uh, you and I share the same sentiment, right? Just because you have a melanoma, it does not mean you should stop living. And uh, there's a lot of benefit by doing outdoor stuff. But coming back to the question that is, you know, how, what do you do when the patient walking in your clinic and how do you examine them and what's your process so that, you know, you can detect the melanoma at the earliest stage without performing a whole bunch of unnecessary biopsies? Well, we do um, full body examination and uh, uh, we start going through the hair. And I end up looking between the toes and everything in between. I don't typically do genital examination in women, but I always bring up to them that uh, if they li- would like me to take a look and see if there's anything uh, untoward, uh, I'd be happy to. But I always ins- uh, I tell them that if they choose not to, that when they get home, they should take a hand mirror and uh, and examine themselves. And if they see anything that is of concern, uh, let me know and uh, uh, have me take a look or I can make arrangements if they're more uh, comfortable with one of my female colleagues to take a look, uh, have them take a look uh, uh, instead. Um, the uh, uh, I look for lesions that are outliers, and I, uh, if you, uh, I suspect that in uh, other materials that you're generating, uh, Dr. Wang, you're going to get into those kinds of things. What patients should be looking for specifically, but I review that with them. Uh, I talk you mean about specifically the, the ABCDEs of melanoma? I do, but I also uh, tell them that uh, our our colleague, our friend uh, uh, Ash Margoob, has come up with the uh, ugly duckling. Yeah, and uh, ugly duckling is actually uh, probably better than ABCDEs for detecting melanoma. But why not do both? So you look for the. You want the, to just um, uh, take a moment and just sort of explain to folks what ABCDE and uh, what ugly duckling is. So ABCDE was invented by a fellow who's still living, one of the finest dermatologists alive, Al Kopf, uh, a grand old man. He's in his nineties and uh, still probably knows more than, than I ever will. And uh, and uh, uh, what they are are. A, B, C, D, E. A is asymmetry. B is an irregular border. C is variegation of color. That means irregular colors with multiple colors. Typically, that's what variegation of color is. Uh, D is diameter. And we talk about greater than six millimeters in diameter, roughly the size of a pencil eraser. And E is evolution. And evolution means change, but you can spin it. Uh, if it's a symptomatic, that would fit into the E. So a symptomatic mole, one that's itching. Uh, that itching is probably new. So in a sense, that's a, a mole in, in evolution. And uh, the, the ugly duckling is uh, what, what Dr. Margoob did, is he noted that, you know, it's usually pretty easy to pick out the melanoma uh, uh, in a sea of other things that people have. It's usually pretty easy to see it because it looks different. It yep. looks different than the other things. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Wayne? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think Coming back to me, I think the E in A, B, C, D, E is more uh, important, especially for the general public. And uh, and also I think, um, I mean, you and I probably don't use the clinical A, B, C, D, E as much because we rely on demoscopy, right? And and I think I agree with you that ugly duckling, just because, you know, if you have all those lesions, that's 
kind of light brownish, but you have one lesion that's pink, that's the ugly duckling one, right? And because everyone tends to think that the melanoma is always black, but you can have a pink, amelanotic, and no colored melanomas, basically. So I, I totally agree with you on that. And then I think we sort of extend that ABCD, excuse me, we sort of extend that ugly duckling into demoscopy findings, right? Uh, maybe this is a good segue. So let's say you look them over and from head to toe, obviously, and uh, then what do you do? Do you use demoscopy and uh, do you, what other devices you use? Uh, well, we do, we take care of a lot of high risk melanoma uh, patients, high risk mole patients, as do you, Dr. Wayne. And I have patients that I know uh, I'm going to probably find a melanoma on them in the next year, highly probable. And I'll often, yeah. I'll, I'll see it every, every visit. And uh, um, those patients, by the way, I don't have come in every six months. Those patients come in every three months. And we do full body photography in those people. It's mm -hmm. not necessary for everybody to have that. Yeah. But we photograph, we do complete, uh, we photograph every mole on their body in groups uh, uh, with about 25 images. And then I take a look at every one of the moles that they have and compare it to the images. Now I only do that with my high risk patients. Yeah. If I see something that do I you, that, do you want to step back and define what is high risk patient, right? Because a lot of the patients come, they have one melanoma and they have like 10, 20 moles and they are fearful, right? But what is your definition of high risk melanoma? Well, it's one of those, you know it when you see it, but they're moles of different sizes, shapes, and colors. And uh, they're also, uh, and many of them, uh, lots of moles by themselves put you at an increased risk. And there's one yeah. rule that's kind of cute called the 7-Eleven rule, uh, which is easy to remember because you can, you know, go to the 7-Eleven and buy a Slurpee or whatever. But uh, the 7-Eleven rule is if you have one, if on your upper extremity, you have 11 moles or on your forearm, you have seven, uh, that puts you in a higher risk category. And you know it's reasonable to get checked out, uh, but these uh, it, there are patients, and fortunately these are unusual cases. They're common in my practice because they get referred to me. Yeah. But um, but and and to you, Doctor Wayne. But uh, there are cases where you it is extremely difficult, even with a dermoscope, to to know what the ugly duckling is. They're all ugly ducklings. Yeah. They can't take off. You can't take off a thousand moles. No, you can't. So, so we do, we rely heavily on full body photography. And and I don't know if you're, uh, the people watching this know what a dermoscope is, but this is a dermoscope. And I always, I have it with me all the time. Yeah, me and, too. Like, I feel like, I'm not in focus. I feel like uh, whenever my battery runs out, I was like, I can't, I can't practice. You know, you have to, you know. Well, get another one. <laughs> <laughs> I've got about three of them. And I'm out, actually, there's a new one out. Now we're talking shop, but there's a new one yeah. coming out that I, I, that's an well, let's table that. Talk to us about, like, you know, what yeah. is this device and how we use it, basically. What is the what? I, pardon me? What, what is what is dermoscope and how do we use it? And, uh, and well, and... I, uh, it, it looks like it's a cheesy magnifying glass that you could, yeah. you know, get out of a Cracker Jack box. But the fact is, it's about a $1,400 instrument. And what makes it remarkable is it allows us to look inside the mold. And uh, normally you can't look inside the mole because of the light reflecting off the surface of the skin. You're blind to what's beyond it. And the, uh, there are very clever optics that are built into this that allow us to look inside the mole. It's like doing a, it's almost like doing a, bio, a biopsy in life. Uh, and what we look for are, uh, 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 the simplest way to put it is we look for order versus chaos. And there are a number of uh, clues that you can uh, that we look specifically look for, that uh, are warning signs that that we apply. But it's basically, is it chaotic or is it well put together? Nature tries to do a good job of putting things together. and uh, But with melanoma, uh, uh, the, the lesion is defying the intent of nature because of all the mutations that are within the melanoma. So that's basically... No, I think this is a really, really good point, right? And I think what I'm going to do is uh, on our website, we're probably going to put some pictures of just regular clinical photos of lesions and dermoscopy photos so people can tell the difference, number one, right? And also, I think it's good to mention that, uh, you know, in addition to worrying about melanoma, the same group of high-risk patients 
will also have increased risk for developing basal cell skin cancer and squamous cell cancer. And devices looking at it with like dermoscope, and you can pick up those lesions as well, right? So, um, so, so do you look at almost every single lesions with dermoscope or do you skip around? What do you do? No, I look for, uh, well, it depends. Uh, if, uh, if they've had a, if, uh, it depends on the moles that I see. So usually you can look at it, uh, 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 maybe a two to three millimeter, very small, evenly colored lesion that looks like just all the other ones. I don't look at those. I will look at most of them with my dermoscope over uh, three millimeters in diameter. And uh, and those I, I, I'll look at. My uh, high-risk melanoma patients that I'm following with, their, with the, uh, uh, with photography uh, and then having them come in and comparing photos. I don't look at all those. I look for the outlier, uh, the new lesion, the lesion that's changed or the new lesion. So you can see a new lesion or a lesion that's changed from the pr a prior examination. I looked at those with my dermoscope and it better be normal. So just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's bad. And, but if it, if it isn't a textbook example, a teaching example, of what a normal law to look like. It's coming off, goes in a jar. But, but that that also depends on the age of the patient, right? Because uh, if you have a younger patient, they can grow new molds and their mold constantly changing. But the elder patient, you're right, that you know, if you see something new and that's atypical, a lot more suspicious, basically. Absolutely agree with you. However, uh, with a young person, when they get that new mold, it should look like a mold. Yeah. And, and so it should be, it should have the absence of chaos. It should look orderly, this new mole. If a young, even, but even with a young person, if, if you look at it and it's uh, uh, scary uh, with a dermoscope, it's, it, it warrants a biopsy. No, I think, um, um, I think here's a, I think I want to plug, give you, I, mean, I think one thing is this device that you know you actually have to know how to interpret what you look at right because in a plenty of study have shown that if you just picked up the scope of looking at it without any training your diagnostic accuracy actually drop and uh, with training they will eventually get better in the hands of experts you can improve it by maybe 20 25 percent right and that's why in every year uh, for the last 10 to 15 years and you run this course at mayo clinic and almost thousands and thousands of physicians are coming and learning that skill set. Um, it's very important. Now, in addition to, so let's step back a little bit. And, and in your mind, obviously, we sort of established for everyone that, you know, the, the doctors should be maybe looking at them with the dermoscope, right? Um, and what other tools do you use? Are there anything else more like optical, genetic, or anything else that you use? We haven't been, so there is, uh, there are other technologies that we haven't used because uh, I haven't, I haven't realized the, uh, necessarily the, I haven't developed comfort with them yet. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, for example, tape stripping. There's a technology where if you find, have an abnormal mole, you can take a piece of tape. It's a brilliant idea. And you take tape and you strip cells off and then, uh, uh, I take that tape and adhere it to a, a piece of cardboard, gets sent in, and genetic analysis is done on that. Uh, on that, and the um, uh, the 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 problem I have with that, or the reason I don't use it, I just I don't want to put down technology. It's brilliant. Te it's great technology, but it's pricey, and uh, you and you. The, the bottom line is if it's if it comes back as showing uh, that it, that it's suspicious, it ends up getting biopsied anyway because nobody's going to make um, decisions, uh, treatment decisions, let's say, based on the on the device. There, it has an element of false positives and false negatives. The situation where I would use it is uh, if I had a lesion that I was really on the fence on, but leaning toward it being benign, but I wasn't sure, but it was in a cosmetically sensitive area, then, then I might use it because there uh, uh, the, um, the light, the ability to exclude a melanoma has value 
And if and the device actually is quite sensitive, meaning that it is is pretty good at excluding. It's not as good as ruling it in, but it's pretty good at it, it, it excluding. So if it says it's benign, it's almost certainly going to be benign. And uh, and that saves the patient a biopsy. But even then, it does have some uh, false negatives associated with it. So you wouldn't want to trust it in, in, with something that you thought was going to be a melanoma. If you thought it was a melanoma and the test came back negative, still it got a biopsy. It's still, you know, probably going to be a melanoma if you thought highly it was going to be. The no, I think, you, I, the I think you touched two really important points, right? One is I think we have all these great technologies, and but and I think in your hands, because you're so good in detecting melanoma, just using gemoscopy, other tools, total body photography, the added value is perhaps a lot less. That's number one. Another point I think you brought up is, to me, I think one type of lesion, the lenticle malignant on the face and sun-damaged skin is very, very difficult, right? And uh, um, and I, I think to me, the facial lesion and the nail lesion and the, and the lesions on the bottom of the foot, sometimes those are the three problematic area. It's very challenging to 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 pick up melanoma. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, the... Um... Uh, the, the foot, uh, we don't have as much problem with, but the problem is if you biopsy it, it's, uh, you know, hard for the patient to walk around on it. Sure, um, sure. Uh, the, uh, but uh, uh, facial lesions um, uh, can be a, a little bit of a struggle. I, I, there are some workarounds that we do, like multiple small biopsies on a, on a larger facial lesion. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the problem is that you can't reliably biopsy part of that and uh, exclude a, a melanoma um and uh, uh nail nails can be can be tough too uh because when you biopsy a nail you're probably going to permanently deform the nail that stated most of the time you bi you're biopsying the nail it's there's some the patient doesn't like what's going on they would just soon have you remove the whole nail uh as uh, 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 uh um rather than have a large black uh um misshapen streak running down it. So the, um, but but you're right, there are special areas where that creates special challenges. Yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, I, I do, I, I completely agree with you. And I think one of the most satisfying lesions sometimes the patient come in is if they have a some sort of subuncle hematoma, like a blood spot under the nail. And this one, like everyone is terrified. They think it's a melanoma, they're looking online, but you know, you and I can look at it within like two seconds. We know this is a very satisfying diagnosis. We can tell someone this is completely benign, no biopsy is needed, right? Uh, but I completely agree with you. If someone have like a streak that that going from the bottom of the nail all the way to the top of the nail, even expanding a little bit bigger, biopsy in this area can be challenging, especially when you try to numb the site, right? And then there's special technique you can do uh, that can minimize the deformity, but still, uh, this is a big issue. The nail is not going to grow out perfectly. Um, what about what about confocal laser microscopy? Do you use that uh, as a added tool for diagnosis? Or we are um, uh, trying to uh, develop that. Uh, I was actually St Stephen. Uh, I was going to. Uh, hoping to hoping to chat with you offline uh, sometime about uh, your experience with that because uh, we have a confocal microscope and and it's a wonderful tool. We uh, um, the problem that we have is that with it uh, has to do with the logistics of setting okay. up, having it set up and taking the images and so on. But we do use it in sensitive areas. I have to say we more commonly find ourselves using it for to exclude basal cell carcinoma on the face in situations where we're not sure it's a basal cell carcinoma. We think the probability is low, but we can't exclude it, say on the nose, but we don't necessarily want to give a younger person a scar on the nose biopsy. And so uh, we use con confocal there quite a bit. That's probably the most common uh, indication for confocal that we have. But I think that the day for confocal is coming. And uh, 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 as the price gets down, as it becomes, as the image qualities improve, the other thing about confocal is uh, uh, you and I have some experience with confocal, but com but dermoscopy is a cakewalk compared to confocal in terms of uh, the learning curve. 
So yeah. there aren't a lot of people who really feel comfortable uh, interpreting, doing uh, confocal uh, image interpretation. No, I think you're right. To me, I think, uh, you know, when I was at Sloan Kettering, we did a lot of work on Confocal, and uh, I found it very helpful for, again, you know, I use it quite a bit sometimes for the facial lesions, just because it's very difficult to pick out lenticle maligna versus like even pigmented actinic keratosis or solo lenticle, which is an old maturity spot, right? And right. here, Confocal is helpful because you can see the dendritic cells, monocells sort of coming up. But sometimes those cells can mimic that of the immune cells, right? So that's the difference. And I, I totally agree with you on the, the, looking at the basal cells on the face, you can look at the difference between like a real basal cell versus intradermal nevus or nevus, like, a, like a, you know, some sort of small papules that's, uh, um, that help you differentiate that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's going to improve with time, as you know. Uh... Uh, being uh, uh, quite authoritative on uh, the the advances of technology that are occurring in this area, that uh, uh, there is uh, um, probably within a, an, our easily usable clinical lifetimes uh, going to be technology that differentiates those cells that you described, the Langerhans cells that can be that look kind of look like melanocytes, yeah. are going to be a different color. They're going to be two colors uh, with uh, uh, confocal, one color that'll be that'll show melanocytes and another color that'll show Langerhans cells. And when we have that available, it's going to uh, it's going to really up the game, I think, for confocal microscopy. So one thing as we kind of wrapping this up, um, here's a question that you know not everyone will have access to you, right? Um, and uh, you know you are specializing melanoma, you're specializing this field. So what should a patient be looking for when they go and see a physician or dermatologist, especially a dermatologist for a skin check? How, how do they know, you know, they're getting a thorough exam? How do they know that, you know, this is the right doctor for them? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's very kind of you to say not everybody has access to you. Um, uh, there, are there, are, there are some people who need access to a tertiary care center, uh, such as us or to, to you, Dr. Wang, or people who are used to taking care of high-risk scenarios. But most people don't need that. And uh, and most dermatologists are really, really good and really caring. And more and more primary care uh, doctors are acquiring the skills to do the yep. screening. But what mm -hmm. I do is, when I have a patient, I'm saying, goodbye, Dr. Swanson, I can't see anymore. I've had an insurance change. Uh, uh, I first of all, I say, well, I'll see you in a couple of years when the insurance changes back because you know, I've been around uh, this long enough to know that that merry go round exists and we and that happens not frequently. But I basically, when they say, how do I find another a, der a dermatologist to take care of me? I say, well, uh, number one, ask your primary care doc who they would go to. That's a great thing to do when your doctor says, oh, I, I my family goes to see so and so, basically, you call them up, but I wouldn't stop there. I, when I when I call them up, I would say, uh, "Hi, I'm I, I I'm just curious. Does your doctor do dermoscopy? Does your dermatologist do dermoscopy?" And if they say yes, you're golden. Go on in there and and, uh, and see them because once dermatologists start doing dermoscopy, they realize, as you alluded to momentarily ago, you can't practice without it. I can't yeah, practice I dermatology without it. I mean, it's like the the field has evolved so much with that in that context that that's just the way it is but if they say no my our dermatologist doesn't do the dermoscopy you say oh okay well thank you very much for your time it has been a pleasure speaking to you today uh, ha have a nice one <laughs> and uh hang up and find the next dermatologist until you find somebody who does that because uh this is 2022 you, and soon to be 2023 you need to see somebody who uh who, who has that skill set so fortunately, maybe... fortunately, no, fortunately uh, 98 plus percent of uh, dermatology residents who graduate now are, have at least some training in dermoscopy. So that's a good tip and um, for, for that. And so we got maybe five minutes left. Um, 
and and I want to maybe just ask you one question. That is, you know, one of the things I find is a lot of time people uh, with the diagnosis come in, they're completely distraught, right? And, you know, sometimes they are very anxious. And what one of the few things that you say to your patients uh, that, that can change that mindset to make them feel better? And, you know, for, let's say, patient with stage one melanoma, right? Uh, what do you say to them? Well, I think the first thing to do, uh, Dr. Wang, is to do something that I know that you do, and that is to acknowledge their fear and uh, and uh, and know that that fear is real. And a lot of that fear comes from uh, information that they're getting, and some of it is good information uh, on the uh, about the serious of, of melanoma. Uh, if it's a thin melanoma, though, I just give I give them the statistics that uh, thin melanoma has an almost one hundred percent disease free survival. Sure. Yeah, in ten years, yeah. and uh, and and you know, and beyond. And so, this is a curable condition. Uh, it gets a little bit uh, uh, more prolonged conversation, obviously, with thicker melanomas. But then, it, I I tell them as I told uh, as I told you before, be alert. If you have a loved one, have them help you do full body examinations every three months. Full body examinations, I tell them, but do it on your partner too. Light a few candles, get a bottle of wine, have adequate light to start with, and make a nice evening of it and just look yourself over. I mean, the spouses are, are uh, I get a lot of referrals from spouses, uh, as do, I think, most dermatologists. And I think that that's very helpful. Or partners, you know. Uh, well, no, uh, so no, this is, so I think I, I tell them, you know, um, you've had this event and uh, we're here to support you in this and we'll take care of you. And we'll keep you, do our best to keep you out of trouble. And you do the same. But once again, life is short. You need to enjoy every day of it. And uh, and uh, don't don't let this be the be the center of your life. No, it's well put. Well put. I, I say the same thing. And uh, again, um, first of all, I want to thank you again for agreeing to participate on this beating melanoma project. And uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And I know you will be a great person to interview because not only you have such a well depth of experience and knowledge, but at the same time, you know, you also give uh, good marital advice to keep relationship more like the, the romance going you know, with candlelight and the self exam. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, uh, for the audience, uh, I have this uh, meeting every year on uh, melanoma diagnosis as well attended as one of the largest uh, meetings of its type in the in the, this country. And uh, uh, I always look to Dr. Wang to close that meeting because of his uh, his his character and his caring and uh, uh, his wisdom. So again, uh, I'm glad you invited me to have this very fun chat this evening with you. Oh, yeah, I I'm sure we can talk for hours, but maybe we can do it in the future. Um, and uh, I, I will see you next week uh, for in, in your conference. Uh, not you. next week, December. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thanks again. Thanks again. Bye, Dr. Swanson.